So I'd like to welcome everybody to uh, what I expect is going to be a fun, provocative, and interesting change of pace colloquium from our usual Earth and Space Sciences cutting edge, uh, Earth and Space Sciences research kind of presentations. Uh, I'm very pleased to welcome uh, Richard Pitt. Um, just before that, I don't believe there are any announcements. Um, uh, many told me there aren't any. Uh, Ramon, if you have any announcements, just let me know. Nope, great, so no, no general announcements. So I'm very pleased to welcome Professor Richard Pitt from University of California, San Diego. Um, Richard is a, a social psychologist and sociologist uh, who studies us, right? He studies, um, uh, um, among other things, he's studied uh, how undergraduates choose their STEM majors or choose their majors in general and how they, how they choose STEM and how various uh, characteristics uh, affect those decisions. Um, he's studied uh, students' uh, religious identities and how they manifest in, their, in what they choose to do when they're in college. Um, and then he's also in recent years undertaken research around uh, STEM postdocs and trying to understand the career choices and decisions uh, that people make in their postdoctoral careers. So this is, this is all part of a, a, a growing uh, emphasis, um, uh, I'd like to think, um, on trying to understand uh, science, the practice of science, and how it can be done better. Um, and so uh, we're thrilled to have Richard here to talk about that. Uh, just a little bit of academic background. Uh, Richard got his uh, undergraduate degree and a master's in education at Penn State University. And then he came here to Arizona, not to Tempe, but to Tucson, where he got his PhD in sociology at the University of Arizona. Uh, he then went on to Vanderbilt University, where he had a number of roles um, in the Department of Sociology, uh, he was a professor of ethics and society in the Divinity School there uh, from 2003, essentially until just this past year when he moved to UCSD, uh, came back west, uh, where he is an associate professor in the Department of Sociology, um, as well as affiliated with their Critical Gender Studies program. Um, so Richard, I hope I didn't leave anything out in terms of, of your uh, brief look at your academic background. Um, uh, I'll just say, I mentioned this in the email to everybody, but I'll say it again. I first, I first met Richard uh, a few years ago when he gave a plenary presentation at the Astrobiology Science Conference that, that I and a number of other people found really spellbinding about, uh, was a presentation about uh, a degree choices, why students choose to go into STEM or not. Um, and uh, I was, I, at that point, I wanted to get him here at some point for a colloquium. So I'm really glad we were able to, to pull that together for, for this time. So Richard, I'll turn it over to you. Uh, look forward to hearing your presentation. Let me, uh, let me stop to share. You should be able to share your slides. There we go. Can you see things like you're supposed to see them? Yes, sir. All right, so Ariel, thank you for inviting me, um, for welcoming me, I appreciate it. Uh, those of you who are hidden in the room that I can't see, thank you for coming. I'm sure there are other things you could be doing with your time. Um, and so I do appreciate you listening to this uh, social scientist talk about uh, family matters. So my talk is on family matters, the impact of family on postdoctoral attrition from the academy. Uh, this work is part of my, I have an NSF grant with a, with a bunch of scientists, so chemists and uh, a phys, uh, I guess Kayvon is a physicist, uh, an astronomer and some other folks where we really wanted to figure out um, how to keep people staying on the road to becoming faculty members and particularly women of color um, and for me, women more broadly. So that's all the names of the folks that are involved in our project broadly. Let me jump right into it. So what I'm planning to cover today are a couple of things. So first, I think it's worth you seeing broadly what my team does before we launch into the conversation about family. And then um, I'll talk about academic career attrition, which is part of this issue for me. Um, really the focus of my research is attrition and persistence. And then we'll launch into the conversation about the project itself. So I'll talk about research methods and sample. And then just to give you a sense of the findings that we'll deal with is where are postdocs going? That is STEM postdocs, where are they going? Um, I'll talk to you about how we define and think about family when we're talking about postdoc families. So how do we uh, 
create boundaries around that idea. Then I will talk about uh, sort of the qualitative issues uh, in our research around family as career issues. And I'll explain that in more detail when we get there and then spend the last chunk of my conversation with you talking about families and work family conflict, which is a big issue. So first, um, this is like the, the mental map, if you will, of the research that my research team works on, the things that we're concerned about. So primarily our main goal was trying to understand academic science careers. Uh, academic science careers take a bunch of characteristics. So you can certainly be um, a faculty member at a PUI who doesn't do much research. Or on the other side of that, you can be a faculty member at a master's granting or uh, research intensive uh, university, where as a tenure track faculty, you're expected to both teach and do research. Or you can do sort of a middle ground space where people still want to work in the academy rather than industry, rather than government, rather than something else but they don't wanna be faculty. They don't wanna be PIs. They don't wanna teach at all. They just wanna be researchers in academic spaces. And so what my team is trying to understand is who, do, who makes that choice uh, after they've gotten a STEM PhD. And certainly for our specific focus, uh, once they've gotten a postdoc and trying to figure out all the kinds of variables that might affect that from community recognition. Do people see you as a scientist? to what kind of career values matter to you? Do you care about making a lot of money? Do you care about uh, social justice? And does that lead you to stay in the academy? I study entrepreneurs, so I'm writing a book on people who start churches. And so that certainly feeds into my work here, understanding if uh, the career as a scientist, that is an academic scientist, is an entrepreneurial career. And if people's orientations to entrepreneurship uh, feeds into whether or not they become what I call an academic knowledge entrepreneur. And then there are certainly all the various ways that we think about science orientations. Uh, our project looks at work experience. It's amazing to me that uh, three quarters of our postdocs have never had a job that was full-time outside the academy. They've always been a student for the most part. And so trying to understand, well, how does that matter? Um, in whether or not someone decides to stay in the academy. Discrimination, of course, has an impact on that. Health has an impact on that. And then what we're gonna talk about today, which is work-family balance, where we're focused on the impact of families on whether or not people are thinking about being academics. Um, and really, I guess the other part of it is, even if you're thinking about being an academic, what might cause you to back away from that? So, this is who my team is. Let's go ahead and talk about why I care about academic career attrition. So just to lay it out there to a bunch of scientists, graduate students, faculty members, postdocs, et cetera, um, that, that just the way it is when it comes to STEM, lots of people are not in academic careers. And we can have long conversations probably during the Q&A about why that is. And you're not gonna really be happy with some of my answers like one of those answers would be, well, there's not enough academic jobs for people who have PhDs. We should produce less of them or fewer of them. But this is the way it plays out for a person like me who cares about diversity in STEM uh, faculty. Half of Black, Latinx, and white female STEM PhDs are in non-academic careers, half of them. Most Asian women, so that is more than half. Most Asian women and men are in non-academic careers. And as much as we're like, oh, well, it's all about uh, diversifying in terms of race and gender, even 61% of white men work outside of the academy. Most people who get PhDs in STEM are not working in the academy. Uh, most work um, in industry, except for black women who often opt out of both industry and the academy and work in government. This is just a way to see that across the disciplines Engineering has more people who are working outside the academy than math and statistics and biosciences. You'll see when I actually talk about where the postdocs say they wanna be, it might reflect some of this, but of course, if you are planning a non-academic position, the likelihood that you will just skip the postdoc, I hope, um, is higher. So you'll see 
that these numbers don't necessarily match the kinds of numbers when we talk about where people plan to go. Uh, but only 26% of engineers are in academic positions if you have a PhD. Lots more people in math and biosciences. What are they doing? The ones who are not in the academy, most of them are doing research and development, which I don't have to explain to you all, I think, uh, how that plays out. The least amount of it is basic research, often because basic research is the purview of those of us who work in the academy. Um, usually if somebody's working in industry, and again, thinking about it in terms of that as the alternate path, really, you know, people are really doing applied research and product development for the most part. Um, what, what stuns me and my team, and it's one of these things that we can't quite figure out yet, is that a fifth of these folks who aren't in the academy aren't working in STEM at all. So it still begs that question, why get a bachelor's degree in STEM and then a master's degree in STEM and then a PhD in STEM only to turn around and not be working in STEM at all? And again, not working in STEM research, not working in STEM at all. They're not even teaching high school chemistry. So that's one of our questions, like how do, why do we lose scientists to science careers is a big question for us uh, that we're trying to work through. Um, so probably I should have, have a minute or two to talk about, well, who cares, Dr. Pitt, um, about whether or not people uh, leave the academy. One of the things for me is, and this was, I've been the director of graduate studies in my program. I've been the dean of diversity at Vanderbilt uh, in the graduate school. So I think a lot about what the PhD is, what the PhD isn't, um, what it can do and what it really doesn't need to do for people. And so as a, also as an education scholar who studies higher ed specifically, yeah, I recognize that the PhD was created as the terminal award for a guild in the same way the MD is a terminal award for a guild, uh, a professional guild in the same way the JD is a terminal award for a guild. And so what we would assume is that people get an MD and what they do with it is they go and do what the MD was created for, which is go be doctors, physicians. Same thing with JDs, right? If someone spends their time and money and resources and their faculty members capital, human, social, cultural capital to gain a JD, you expect at the end of those three or four years that someone will go and do what the JD was created for, which is they will join the guild, right? They will join the guild of lawyers, right? Um, same thing with the PhD, is that the PhD was the terminal award for the guild. That's what you got a PhD for. You didn't get a PhD to go work for industry. But what has happened over time is as we've up credentialed, that is, as we've told every new generation that a high school diploma is not enough, and then we told them an associate's degree is not enough, and then we told them the bachelor's degree is not enough, and then we told them you got to get an MA or an MBA if you're going to get a job. Um, what we what winds up happening is we keep for for without actually changing the skills for jobs, we just change the credential needed for that job, right? And so we're getting to this place where you know you could be a police officer without getting a degree. Um, but now you have to have a degree in what? Sociology or English or criminology in order to be a police officer, even though the actual skills to be a police officer haven't changed at all, right? So another example of that is pilots. You might be surprised to know that pilots, being a pilot does not require a bachelor's degree because there are not skills that you learn in college that make sense to be a pilot which is why many pilots actually come out of the military where they actually learn how to fly things. But slowly but surely, we see that more people, more airlines are saying, uh, we want you to have a bachelor's degree or an associate's degree because we want to have a workforce that looks like it's educated, which is not about skills, it's about signals. And so one of my issues is that I think there are a whole bunch of people getting PhDs that is staying in a PhD department. I'm sorry, faculty, I'm, I'm saying things that we do not want the graduate students to hear. But um, I certainly, the concern for me and my team is that people stay in graduate school to get the PhD when the jobs they actually want 
don't require the PhD, right? Again, because the PhD's real purpose is to get people into the guild. Um, and so in terms of skills, the master's in most STEM fields is sufficient. And all you have to do really is look at ads for jobs in STEM, and you will see very quickly that they want at least a master's degree. A PhD would be great, but what they really would prefer is, is experience. And our graduate students are not getting experience working on a PhD. Like that's not the actual credential that the PhD produces, okay? And so often I'm encouraging students, look, if, if you want an all at career, you really need to think about leaving at the master's level um, because for the job you tell us you wanna do, you do not need a PhD. Problem with the postdoc, for a person like me who has problems with credentialing and over up credentialing is it's another credential that many scientists waste time pursuing. And, and, and I'm gonna say it like I feel it. Not only waste their time, they waste faculty time, right? Both graduate students and postdocs, right? All the time that we spend, not just helping you get a credential, that is the write the dissertation and get a PhD, but all the time that we spend reviewing papers and trying to make sure that you get papers published and all these things so that you will then be competitive for an academic job to then have students not really be interested in an academic job. We are wasting your time and our time having you get credentials that are not necessary for employment in non-academic jobs. They want experience. They do not want to know that you can write yet another paper that goes into a journal. So, so it's another credential that many scientists waste time pursuing because those jobs don't need them to have a PhD. A postdoc, they might need to have a PhD, but they certainly don't need a postdoc. They already have enough qualified non-postdoc candidates to do the work that they need. And the research is so disappointing, I think, when students really think about it or hear about it, that, that these non-academic jobs don't pay you for this additional investment in human capital, okay? Um, and I suppose students are like, well, that's fine. I didn't, I didn't pay for it, right? The school invested the money, um, but the money that you're losing by not gaining experience, you never actually uh, get that money back, right? And so what we find is that uh, people who do postdocs wind up trailing people who just got the PhD for the rest of their career, both in terms of long-term lifetime earnings, um, but also in eventual earnings. That is what their top salary winds up being. The people who just took their post, took their PhD into the workforce, they gain the experience faster and therefore they start to make more money sooner. So one thing I'll say, and again, I'll say it and drop it, but I need to say it, is if you're not planning an academic career, Dr. Pitt, the higher ed scholar who studies postdocs and doctoral students outcomes in STEM tells you that if you're not planning an academic career, you should reconsider doing a postdoc so that we are not having the conversations I'm about to have with you uh, about like, why are you in your third year in a postdoc uh, not interested in, in being a faculty member, but here you are, right? Three years later, you know, wondering how you've uh, ruined your life or as we're gonna talk about, uh, maybe disrupted your partner's life. So again, nobody wants to hear this, especially I know there are postdocs in the room. Nobody wants to hear it. Um, really be thoughtful if you're a grad student about getting a postdoc. If you are currently a first year postdoc, Dr. Pitt says, think very carefully about whether or not you need to be a fifth year postdoc, um, really important. So that's my general sense about attrition. I don't want people to attrit, which is why I want them to leave before they get the PhD. Um, and so my real agenda is I want people who get the PhD to be in the academy, particularly black and brown people, particularly women, because we need to diversify the professoriate. We need to broaden participation in science at this level. And one of the best ways for us to broaden participation, that is get black and brown uh, high, high school students and college students to go into the sciences particularly the sciences we're talking about, not biology, but really chemistry and physics and um, engineering and other things, they need role models. And so we're not just broadening participation um, and increasing diversity in the professoriate um, for its own sake, in the sense that 
we learn different things if the professoriate is diverse, but it's also important that, that upcoming folks, black and brown folks who didn't think science was for them, women who didn't think science was for them, have role models in these disciplines where we are rare, um, where they can see us and then say, I think that's something I can do too. So my agenda is to get people who have a PhD to stay in the academy and not take all of that human capital and other things that often the university invested in financially, right, in terms of the financial investment, we want you to take that into the academy, into the guild. That's why we, we pay your tuition and give you a stipend because we are investing in the guild. So uh, what my team wanted to do is understand, well, what causes people to leave uh, the academy? especially these people who have a PhD and now have doubled down on training to get a postdoc. So we did a survey using Qualtrics, 192 questions. It was a long survey. It's uh, longitudinal. And so we had uh, respondents do it over the course of three years. I'm only gonna talk about the base survey because it just tells us everything we need to know, to be honest with you. Um, and there were lots of things we cared about, right? Uh, demographics, STEM orientation, some of the things I showed you already on that first screen, um, uh, and academic research identity and other things that played out when we actually recruited our sample. So who was our, who was our sample? You see there the list of participating universities. There were about 26 of them. These are all certainly R1s. These are the top um, R1s in science. Um, or in general in terms of postdocs, in terms of both the number of postdocs they have, um, but where their postdocs land. It was important to us in terms of our recruitment parameters was to only use STEM disciplines, the ones listed there, agriculture, biology, biomed, et cetera, not disciplines like mine. So there are no social scientists in our sample. Um, we wanted people to have their first postdocs. So we know that people do these iterative versions of postdocs. We wanted people who were on their first postdoc, and we only wanted people in years one through three in that postdoc, and also to constrain it because we also know the demographics of both the postdoc world and what people do beyond the postdoc. We understand that. So we also reduced our uh, sample to just US citizens or permanent residents so that we could get more clarity about what drives um, people's decisions post postdoc. You see there, we wound up with a sample of 215 respondents. We oversampled women and then waited for them when appropriate. Um, we didn't need to wait for race because our numbers wind up looking very similar to the STEM postdoc community. Uh, sexuality, about 15% of our postdocs are uh, LGB. Uh, again, we wanted to follow first year postdocs, so half of them were first year postdocs. Again, we control for that. And then there are the disciplines. So agriculture, uh, bio and life sciences, engineering, comp sci, physical sciences and math, and then STEM education. As you see there, most postdocs, the bulk of postdocs are, are biological and biomed. And that certainly follows from what people say their uh, plans are going to be. But some of it is because uh, culturally, uh, biological and biomedical sciences, people just think, well, if I have a PhD in, in bioinformatics, in order to get a job in the academy, out of the academy, I need to get a postdoc, and that's just not true. It's just not true, but it becomes a cultural norm, so we do what we do. Uh, so let's look at where postdocs are going. What we ask them is right now, if you had to choose only one career path, from the list, and there was a long list of uh, research and non-research jobs in the academy, in industry, in government, and what we call other. And we asked them if you had to choose only one career path from that list of 30 paths, which one would you choose? We were happy to see that um, when we asked them to sort of check the ones you would consider, 81% said that they consider an academic career. We love that. 20% um, are planning non-research careers. Again, a quandary, like why are you getting a research degree? That's what the PhD is. Um, it's not an applied degree, it's a research degree. 
why then would you pursue or plan to pursue a non-research career? Um, so again, trying to think through that. But you see there the numbers that 64% of postdocs in STEM want to work in the academy. And I broke it out up here because I think this becomes important for us to again think about what we're talking about, who we're talking about, is that R1 faculty, that list is faculty who plan to work in a research, who plan to do both research and teaching at a high level. Uh, staff are people who don't plan to teach at all. They will only work as research staff, which means they're not likely to be tenure track staff unless they are uh, faculty or professors of the practice, if you will. And then PUI faculty would be people who work at predominantly undergraduate institutions, small liberal arts colleges, teaching science primarily. They might do a little bit of research, but they're not really required to do it at the same level of what we call a PI, right? Um, quickly, you just see the numbers in terms of gender, not very different across the board, really the trade-off is between industry and government. Um, this is stable from year one to three. So people come in with a postdoc wanting to work in the academy and they leave three years later with a postdoc wanting to work in the academy. We don't see many changes over time, but that means that it's also not changing in the opposite direction. So somebody comes in saying, I wanna work in an industry career and they don't then flip over the three years and are suddenly convinced to become an academic. Like that's not happening. And so faculty who are like, oh, I know you're saying you wanna work for uh, Dinotech or whatever, making dinosaurs for engine, making dinosaurs. But if you hang out with us, you'll grow to love, you'll grow an academic identity. It's just not happening. Uh, they stay where they're staying or they drop out of the postdoc because they realize this is a waste of time. Uh, for me to get my job in Engine because Engine will hire me with just a postdoc with a PhD. And then finally, to give you a sense of the disciplines, right? And so engineers are least likely of, of the folks in our postdoc sample, they're the least likely to be in our postdoc sample interested in academic jobs. And then it just goes as you see there, life sciences, the physical sciences are more likely to say that 73% say that they want an academic job, 95% uh, math and comp sci PhDs who get a postdoc want an uh, academic job. And then everybody in STEM education wants an academic job. And really for them, most of them, that is this last group, the STEM education folks, they want to work at uh, small liberal arts colleges and predominantly undergraduate institutions. And so one of the dynamics, again, I want to drill into your head that the point of the PhD is about joining the guild and preparing for the guild and gaining the credentials for the guild. And what are those credentials? They are papers and presentations at conferences. And so if we are training you for the guild, what we're not doing is training you for the workforce that is this industry, government, science, education, policy, and writing. Like we, for the most part, are not training um, postdocs or advanced graduate students for those kinds of jobs. We're just not. And you know how I know that? Because the postdocs and the graduate students tell us that they're not. And then employers tell us that we are producing people in, from postdocs that they, you know, I don't need to hire this person. They don't have any more skills than they had uh, when they graduated with their PhD. And I'd rather not have to pay the premium uh, to hire them and I won't pay a wage premium because they have this additional training when I needed them to have three years of experience. Really important to know. So let's finally get to uh, the heart of the matter is my question around does family affect this, right? I do not believe and my team doesn't believe and we've been arguing that people are not making the decision about whether or not they go into the academy just by looking at their resume. They're looking at other things and we, I'm a sociologist, so I believe that uh, interactions with important people help shape your identity. And certainly if uh, relationships with important people shape your identity, you have to imagine they also shape your professional identity and your aspirations for your profession. So for us looking at just like Another project of ours, we look at the impact of PIs, that is our mentors. Um, this is just looking at our, our, you know, the main people in our lives, our partners and our children and how that affects these decisions. So uh, Richard, how do you define family? We define family as 
uh, if people are in a committed relationship, more than a non-monogamous dating. So are you single is one of the questions, um, uh, whether they're married or not. So if people tell us they're in a committed, uh, married-like relationship, we consider them coupled. And if they're in a married relationship, we consider them coupled. And you see that of our 215 postdocs, 75% of them are coupled. These people came to, and you'll see this in a moment, they came to their postdoc with a trailing spouse, right? Someone upended their life, and it wasn't just an individual person, two people um, upended their life to pursue the postdoc. 18% of these folks, so fewer of them have a child or expecting a child. And so that's how my team defines family. Most of what I'll talk about here is thinking about couples, but kids play a role and we'll talk about that uh, when we get to it. Who are these folks? Uh, most of them are in, as I said, in relationships that are older than three years, they have trailing spouses. The majority of these folks' partners have more than a BA, so their partners are educated. 25% also have a PhD, so you can imagine that has an impact on uh, the double body problem. Most of them, their partners are working in full-time jobs, which begs the question, when I'm done with my postdoc, uh, what happens to my partner's job? And then some important dynamics around race and sexuality, that non-whites are less likely to be coupled than whites, that looks like a trend we see outside of the academy, of course. And then LGB postdocs are less likely to be coupled uh, than heterosexual postdocs. I study gender, and so it's important to me to also think about are there gender differences here? We didn't, and especially because when we talk about family, people always assume that this is a woman conversation only, and it just is not. Put that on the table. Right? So there are no differences in the likelihood of being coupled uh, for men or women. There are no differences in the likelihood of being a parent. Men are as likely to be a parent as women postdocs. There are no differences in the likelihood that their partner has a PhD. There are no differences in the likelihood that their partner has a full-time job. So men and women postdocs, their families look very similar to each other. Uh, where the differences are is what their parent, what the partner does if the partner has a full-time job. So either the partner uh, for women is more likely to work in industry. Uh, the men's partner are more likely to work in the academy. And those, those differences might shape these outcomes in the way I wanna show you now. So while, while you, you know, what we don't find is a, a, a family difference in terms of whether or not people want to be academic. So 65% of people who are coupled are interested say they're interested in being academic. That's the same as the singles. The dynamic though is that while coupled postdocs are interested in academic careers, our quality, like they say it on the survey, I want an academic career, 64%. Our qualitative interviews with them reveal ways that their families will actually shape how those interests play out, right? As I've been saying, they don't make the decision. I can have an aspiration, but if, if I have to, when I have to make the decision, I don't make that decision to actually go into an academic career in a vacuum. And so what we found out is that there are some dynamics in having a family, having a, a husband or wife or husband-like, wife-like partner um, or having children that impacts whether or not people think, oh yeah, I could just pick whatever job I want. I just go in the job market like any old person and can get a job. Well, that's not how it works. And so, uh, listen up, postdocs. This is, this is for you uh, to some degree, even more than the faculty. So the first is, and some of these things actually we hear from graduate students, um, is this idea of portability of careers. So this is a quote. It was a difficult conversation. He had gotten situated in a nicer job than he'd had in years. Remember, 80% of their partners have full-time jobs. But I had to present it as I'm going to be held professionally, held back professionally, if we stay here. So what it was the dynamic of for this person was my partner wanted to stay in the job that he had, but I was like, I can't just pick any job here in the city. I won't be able to move forward in the profession because there are no universities for me to work at here. And so what she, what she was essentially saying is your job is more portable than my job. There's more opportunities for you to work in your field somewhere else than for me to work in my field. 
somewhere else. And that runs into the into a wall when 45% of our respondents say their partners would move anywhere, which means 55% say, I am going to constrain where I'm interested in living. And any of you, again, we're thinking about the academy, right? As there are 3,000 plus universities and colleges, all of them are not research intensive spaces uh, in wonderful places in terms of ideal job. And so if our partners are saying that uh, they're not willing to move, then we have a, we have a problem when we're done our postdoc deciding whether or not or how we're gonna go into the academy. Taking turns, this one makes, makes my head hurt to be honest with you. And that is where the student said or the postdoc said, he put his career on hold all six years I was in grad school. And then he followed me here to this postdoc. And so we've agreed that the next move in our careers, it's his turn to choose. And so essentially what her partner and she agreed to is that here I am, I'm actually pursuing my career goals. And it's like, no, you're not pursuing your career goals. You're pursuing training. <laughs> here I am pursuing my career goals. And so what we'll do is when I'm done all of my training, it's your turn to find a job and pursue your career goals without again, recognizing that the postdoc and graduate school is not people's job. It is training for a job, which means that none of these often women have started their career. So it becomes this crazy thing of, oh, I'm going to get a PhD, but I'm not gonna pursue a job using my PhD because it's your turn to find a job. Like, wait, any of you who have friends with MDs, their partners certainly recognize that after I'm done my MD, I still have to do a residency. And that residency controls my life a little bit, but I'm not gonna graduate from my residency, be done with my residency as an MD, and then they'll get, not get a job in medicine because you wanna be an architect in some place where there's no hospital. Like that's just not gonna work. Um, but this is how people, how postdocs are living their lives. Future family plans, this one seems obvious. This is, I wanna have a family and kids. I can't imagine myself working 12 to 14 hours a day and still be able to dedicate time to my kids. Men and women say this. Um, I don't wanna have nannies raising my kids. So people's concern is that they won't be able to have families if they get an academic career. 9% um, say, that work-life balance is better in the academy. That is that I can have my work and I can have my life that is a family um, in the academy. Not even 10% of postdocs believe that's true. And then this is the final one, right? Where uh, two of the people have PhDs, 25% of our postdocs partners have PhDs and some of them are in school finishing up those PhDs. So the number of two-body problem folks is gonna grow um, by the time the person's done their postdoc. And so this would be an example of that. My husband is a geologist at whatever the university was. We Skype every night. We've been long distance for over four years now while he's been in his academic position as a person with a PhD. We talk about whether that's sustainable when I'm done here. And so again, in this case, he is actually, he, the, the postdoc is trying to think through when I'm done my postdoc, what do the two of us with the PhD do if I can't find a job with my postdoc as a faculty member um, at my husband's university. And so these are the qualitative things that affect whether or not people actually wind up working in the academy, regardless of their aspirations to do so, right? And this is, this is a different show entirely than the one we always have, which is there are no jobs and other things. This is not a conversation about there are no jobs. This is a conversation about agency, not a conversation, a simple conversation about fixing the structure of the academy, right? People lose some agency to some degree because they are connected to a different kind of structure that matters, and that is a family. So the last part of this that I wanna sort of hang out with is uh, probably a, a dynamic around family that singles don't quite have. Um, is this problem of work family imbalance, work family conflicts, where we ask our respondents, does your job, the amount of time your job takes up make it difficult to fulfill your family responsibilities? Does 
your job uh, cause you to make changes to your plans for family activities? And we ask it in the other direction. So not just does your job get in the way of your family, we also ask if your family gets in the way of your job. So things like the demands of my family interfere with my job related activities, or um, I have to put off doing things at my job because of demands on my time at home. And so what we want to figure out is do people experience work family conflicts? And we find among postdocs, yes, ish, yes, ish. So we looked at two different kinds of uh, families. So we looked at couples who didn't have kids and you see it right there that couples without kids, that is just two people that work interferes with people's family in a, in a, in a where they say, I agree or strongly agree with this on the scale that makes up the work family conflict um, scale. And so a lot of our postdocs are experiencing work family conflict, 61%. Now what's the flip of that, right, is, is my family getting in the way with my ability to be productive at work? And what we find is when it's just a partner and me, um, not really. If anything, my family, my partner is supportive, right? One of the things we find that, that amazes me is that uh, people who have partners are actually more productive in terms of writing papers and, and co-authoring papers uh, than people without families. And some of that is a function of my family, my partner helps me uh, is a collaborator on some of my research, right? Homophily means I'm likely to have dated someone who is also a scientist who can understand when I say, can you look at this chart? Can you look at this graph? Can you look at these numbers? Um, so family doesn't interfere with work at the same level that work interferes with family when we're talking about a uh, couple people without kids. But when we throw some kids in the mix, the work interferes with family doesn't change really. So work is a problem for everybody, period, hard stop. But when you have kids, and I hate to use this language where kids are a problem, but kids are a problem for people's aspirations and goals. And that is because the kid actually interferes with people's productivity and their ability to get their work done. And other work that we've been doing around work family conflict, people feel discriminated against when they have kids, when they have work family conflict. And some of that is because people assume that they're not gonna be able to get the same amount of work done because they have kids, even if they believe they are fully capable of doing the work. And so kids can be a problem. Uh, both for your ability to get your work done, but also for other people's sense of you being able to get your work done, which means people then don't work with you, which means you don't have outcomes that you're trying to get. Um, one of the things that is fascinating to, to us is that, again, you see these numbers. What is fascinating to us is that work family conflict sucks. We all don't want it, but an important thing around work family conflict is it has negative impacts. So work family imbalance, I also study health. Dr. Pitt studies everything it feels like uh, when you're studying human beings. Um, but work family imbalance is associated with general poor health. Uh, you have more depressive symptoms if you have work family imbalance, more anxiety symptoms, more generalized stress, uh, lower satisfaction with life. And so these 61, 66, 57% of our postdocs who have imbalance between their work duties and their family duties, right? The strain that comes often from the conflicts um, between the two winds up having a negative impact on people's health. It also causes people to have less interest in being faculty. Some of it is because they look at us, that is their PIs and their mentors, and they say, well, she put off her life in order to get tenure and I'm not gonna do that, or I'm having a hard enough time managing this now, I see my mentor not having kids, or my mentor who's not as productive as other mentors who has kids, I don't wanna be that, I need to just go out and have a regular job. The other part of that is this, this belief that there is more work-life balance outside of the academy. So postdocs look at their own life stressed out, right? If I'm, if I'm stressed out as a postdoc, uh, trying to make sure my family and my work uh, work well, play well together. 
uh, I really expect that to be worse when I'm the boss, right? When I'm trying to get tenure, when I'm responsible for getting the grants, I expect that my work will even more encroach upon my family or vice versa. Um, and that of course causes people to say, then the academy might not, it's not just, I am not interested, the academy might not be the best place for me and therefore I choose a non-academic job ultimately, right? When, when you know, the doo-doo hits the fan, right? I'm going to err on the side of having more work-life balance. So to summarize what I've talked about here, again, I've thrown a lot of things at you, so I'm gonna leave the summary up in terms of sort of the main takeaway points. The first is that lots of postdocs are coupled, right? And faculty PIs need to understand that. Um, and we need to understand how being coupled, which is a thing, 75% of them are, graduate students less so, but certainly postdocs are, are grown folks. Uh, lots of postdocs are coupled. What we also need to recognize is that both coupling and parenthood is not gendered. There are ways that gender might affect this and I struggle with it and I say some things, it'll, I'll probably say some of those things in our conversation in the Q&A that make people angry um, around some of the decision-making that ultimately happens, like this taking turns thing, that is gendered. Women are more likely to do the taking turn thing than men. Women are more likely to follow their spouse and not be an academic than men. Coupling and parenthood is engendered. What people do with their coupling and parenthood is. Coupling and trailing spouses create career aspiration issues. Again, not just in what you aspire to do, but how you actually play this out. Um, so in the ways that I said, career portability, this taking turns problem, the two body problem, and what I want you to also take home, and I just suggested it, is that all three of those things there, career portability, taking turns and two body problems are gendered in the way that women are less likely, men are less likely to give up their uh, STEM academic career for their wives for these reasons. Women are more likely to do so, which as a person who studies gender is very problematic for me. Um, and then finally, current and imagined work family imbalance is a problem, A, for a person like me who wants these folks to stay academics, uh, if they're stressed out over their work family imbalance, it reduces interest in an academic career. As I said, it's a common characteristic among coupled postdocs. Partners don't handicap productivity, but kids do. So we have an additional problem um, when kids come into the picture. Uh, I've shown you work family imbalance is unhealthy. Um, and that's controlling for a range of things, like even productivity and what school you graduated from and how good your mentor is. Work family imbalance is still unhealthy. And then imbalanced postdocs believe there's more work-life balance outside the academy. And we worry then that that drives them out of the academy. What is amazing to me is that 85% of imbalanced postdocs believe there's more work-life balance outside of the academy, only 42% of the non-imbalanced postdocs who are coupled say that same thing, which means we have got to figure out how to get rid of the work-life balance problem to get rid of this 85, 42% difference in the way people think um, their careers will be uh, in the academy. Um, so that's, that's, that's Michelle. Um, are there questions? So thanks. That, that was, that was great. I don't know why my camera isn't working here. I apologize for that. I'll try to figure that out in a minute. Uh, but I am here. Uh, so please put questions in the, um, in the Q and A, uh, they're flooding in, as you might imagine, we, we arranged this presentation folks to have a little more time for Q and A maybe than the normal, which is great because this is a provocative set of topics and observations. Um, I'm just going to go in order of submission here, unless I see some repetition or whatever. So uh, first question here, um, have you done any research about how the risk of family dissolution is higher for postdocs? And if so, how that affects career choices? No, haven't even gotten to it. So I'm not even going to pretend we've started that process. Do not know. Oh, wait, 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 before I go too far. So one of our questions, again, we asked so many questions. So one of our, going to this question around uh, dissolution, we really want to think about 
power in these households, right? So it really goes to this question of who has the power? Who feels like I lose more if we break up, right? Which is always an important conversation that people have um, around risk when they think about leaving a relationship. Do I gain or lose by leaving this relationship? And so what we do is we ask them, will your sex life go up or down or will your partner's sex life go up or down if you, your marriage ended or your relationship ended? Would your networks, your friendships change? Would your opportunities for employment change? Would your ability to raise your children change? And so we have those answers in our data just to get a sense of the power dynamics at play. We just haven't um, explored those relationships with the kinds of things I'm showing you. All right, uh, Robert Lloyd asks, uh, you showed that over half of postdocs with children said that family interferes with work. Do you know if that belief is actually borne out by the data? For example, do postdocs with children publish more or less? That's what they feel. Uh, is, no, is the we didn't see that there's a difference in their actual productivity, which begs the question, right? Are they, you know, what we can find, right, is that that's partially one of the reasons why they are less healthy is because they are doing the sort of like, it's almost like the double shift kind of, kind, of, kind of conversation is I'm stressing out trying to manage my kids and my work. Therefore, I'm doing more on both ends, like staying up longer to match what my peers are doing. So they, they have the same outcomes in terms of authorship, in terms of coming up with their own projects, et cetera, but it is making them, to use a word, crazy. Uh, an anonymous attendee asks, and I'm sorry about my camera. I don't know what's going on. I'm just gonna turn it off and I'll just be a Ooh, the anonymous voice. voice. Yeah. Uh, did you look at the effect of PI interactions in relation to postdoc family interference or attrition? I can imagine a situation where someone had an ideal PI, quote unquote, in their PhD that would allow them to have better work-life family balance, but the postdoc PI provides a different environment where the postdoc individual is discouraged about their future work life, uh, work and family aspirations. Yeah, we can, I'm telling you, getting me started about PIs, that is the whole nother show. PIs are as much of this conversation about what people wind up doing as families in even more problematic ways, um, both by modeling, by understanding what the postdoc is about, right? Thinking that I'm hiring uh, workers when you're supposed to be hiring trainees who are supposed to have a goal in mind that you are supposed to be working towards, which means you have to understand what it is. And so any of the conversations we might wanna have about how PIs interact in this dynamic around family are shaped by none of the 70 faculty members at um, ASU, of course, but at those other schools, the 26 where we surveyed graduate students or postdocs, they're often terrible. Um, at the graduate level, often terrible, and at the postdoc level, often terrible, because faculty often do not know how to, how to think about that I'm training people, easier at the graduate level, right, because we know that. Um, but there's something about STEM where people sort of slip the gear a little bit around what the point is and that a postdoc is not a bench scientist they're not a staff scientist they are a trainee just like a medical school resident is a trainee um and so or, or yeah medical resident house staff is a trainee and we worry that faculty just are not thoughtful about that and so these kind of conversations that i'm having with you about family lots of postdocs would never even not lots of pis faculty members would never think to have these conversations because they are not thinking about how these things actually impact people's final decisions. Partially because they're not thinking about that the postdoc is supposed to be getting people to want to be academics and not wasting people's time so that they can go teach high school chemistry. It makes no sense. All right, uh, Jackie Monkowitz uh, asks, uh, you describe people choosing to leave academia for non-academic jobs after a postdoc as a waste of time and resources and training for everyone involved, but uh, many and most people who accept the postdoc intend to stay in academia at the outset, so that changes as they go on until they decide to leave. So this sounds like systemic problems and inequities are driving people out? Question mark. Uh, yeah, yes and no. So again, for me, one of the problems is that 64% want to be academics when they come in. 
that they leave not, not wanting to be academics is, I would argue, a waste of time. Again, if you're just gonna be quote unquote jest, right? Um, this is all relativeness, right? If you are ultimately going to be a science writer or a docent at a, at a natural history museum, or nat uh, yeah, natural history museum. So some of it is that, you know, more than half, but less than three quarters of people starting postdocs in STEM are not interested in being academics and only 38% want to be faculty. So again, let's think about these numbers a little more carefully than I think we normally do, is if 64 want to be academics, there's a chunk of them who don't want to be any of the people I'm looking at in the screen who are faculty. They do not want to be R1 faculty, master's granting institution, tenure track faculty who have to do research and teaching, right? And so there's a lot of folks who are in the postdoc pool who don't have these aspirations. And I keep arguing then we need to fix that problem at the graduate level. Um, and what we don't find is that people are like, oh, well, there's no jobs for me. And so now I'm going to change my mind. Like people don't say they're going to change their mind. They certainly run into the wall of there aren't enough jobs. But again, the things you do not want me to go on and on about, like, you know, young PIs, sort of new assistant professors get so mad at me when I say we need to have less, fewer postdocs. <laughs> because they're like, how am I supposed to get my research agenda done if I don't have postdocs? Um, and the answer is hire a bench scientist. Um, but you know, nobody's trying to hear that because we have a model of cheap labor called the postdoc. And so there's this problem of us knowing what needs to be done to do this better for people's lives, for people's lives. But you know, it's hard to get our, our values and our needs, you know, in a coherent way, right? Thomas Jefferson owned people when he was saying life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. So it's really hard sometimes to say, I know I care about these outcomes and I know that hiring this person for a postdoc who doesn't want an academic career is problematic for them, but it gets me a cheap bench scientist and that's what I need. And so that's what I do. And there's a tension there and I recognize that tension. So there are some questions that get to uh, talking about solutions, which I think uh, given that we're running low on time, I'd like to get to some of those. So apologies for skipping some of the other questions. Um, uh, Maitri Bowes asks, um, she's one of our faculty, thanks for that excellent talk. My partner and I are both academics with a kid, so could relate to a lot of the things you said. Two questions. One, how much do you think the attrition is a result of time, the time it takes to get a PhD or to complete a postdoc? Would it help to have them be shorter like in Europe? And number two, what did you think about situations where one person in a relationship has to stop working because of children? Uh, so uh, let me zip through. So, so let me let me deal with the second one first, because uh, time to degree or time to to the end of the postdoc. My team also argues postdocs again. A postdoc is what it is about collecting credentials. And why do you need five years to collect the credential unless again you're trying to produce something? And I shouldn't bring you in as a postdoc if I can't produce something in three years. Um, and it shouldn't be shorter because then you know what's the point of a one year postdoc? Uh, when you really could be go working in industry and get hired. So, so that's the first dynamic right around time to finishing. The, the other thing, and this is where I, I wind up in these walls where people are like, change the structure, change the, you know, and this often you can imagine, I've already shown you or sold you that this becomes a woman problem in practice, right? Where men, God bless them. Some of my best friends are men with PhDs who are married or partnered with other people who have PhDs. Um, but I am always struck as a sociologist of gender trying to undo gender orders with how folks with PhDs are still operating in a gendered order system where the person who has the baby uh, is the one who then is responsible to raise the baby and all the decisions around having a child and then who becomes the baby raiser, becomes gendered in these ways that disenfranchise women in ways that make it harder for us to broaden participation and increase uh, the number of women in the diversify the professoriate, right? And so some of it I wrestle with often and have to say out loud 
that before we can change these systems that make it hard for women to raise their children and have jobs, we have to have more women. And some of it is like training people to have these conversations. We have to have more women look across the dinner table at their male partners, usually male partners, and say, I have a job and you have a job. I'm a parent and you're a parent. My career cannot suffer because we decided to parent, right? And that's a conversation that needs to happen in homes before it happens in departments and at the provost level and in industry and everywhere else. And I think that's a challenge for some folks to hear, to be honest with you. So I, th I think I might've gotten my, no, I didn't. I thought I got my camera to work. Um, I wanted to, uh, we've reached the end of the, of the hour. So I wanted to thank you in person or at least at least visually. So um, I wanna thank you very much for taking the time to be with us. If you're willing to stick with us a little longer, there's a lot more questions. I don't know, if we, there's no way we can get through all of them. Um, but if you're willing to stick around a little bit more, we can uh, uh, get through a few more of them. But I wanna give everybody who has to go somewhere a chance to, to take off. Um, so so let's say everybody give, uh, there have been a lot of thanks in the chat, but give a round of applause virtual, however you want to, however you want to, to <laughs> Richard for a provocative and impactful talk, lots and lots of comments, especially from our faculty is nice to see. Um, thanking you for bringing us all this thought provoking material, um, stuff we need to be thinking about and talking about more that, that we don't as much as we should. So, so thank you for that. Um, and uh, if you, like to stay longer. Um, yeah, I can read off more questions. Your, totally your call. Yeah, yeah, I'm here. Okay. Um, so, folks need to leave. Feel free to go. Um, and uh, if you want to stick around, I'll just I'll just scroll down some more of these questions. Uh, Catherine Elder asks, uh, and I'm sorry, there's so many. It's been impossible for me to order them on the fly. So I'll, I'll try not to be repetitive. But uh, for someone who wants to be a researcher outside of the academy. Do your opinions about postdoc positions hold for postdocs, which are at a non-academic facility? Um, and this is a big yeah, deal so for our community because because we have a lot of people who want to go to work in NASA laboratories, JPL, places like that. Yeah. So so again, it's 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 just like with the PhD. There's always the question that the trainee has to ask themselves: Is why am I doing this? To what end? And some of it is because I want to have a particular job. Some of it is because I want a particular income. Uh, often to support my family. Um, and so a lot of that work has to be thought out really at all of these levels. And, you know, I, my team and I have spent more time than we probably need to, to be honest with you, looking at job ads for a range of jobs across the disciplines, um, et cetera. And what we just keep finding is that jobs that will pay you $83,000, uh, $130,000 outside of the academy routinely are super clear in the job ads. All we need is a PhD if we need that. And again, this, this is like Southwest Research Institute's job, the one I looked at just today for this conversation uh, in heliophysics right, where they'll pay you $130,000 and they're like, have a PhD and one year of experience minimum for that job. And again, I think we can have these conversations about how competitive I am for the job, but what they've also told us is you are not more competitive because you've done a three to five year postdoc. Like that's what the industries have told people who have told NSF, they've told NIH, Right, that we are not going to pay people a wage premium. And we're not going to hire them just because they got a postdoc because we don't need that additional credential. We can't put that on the web page, postdoc, 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 when we already have Richard Pitt, comma, PhD there. It doesn't buy them anything. They're not going to hire. At the level that I think people think they are for the wasted time, quote unquote, wasted time, of getting this additional training. It doesn't pay off. It's not like a medical residency. It's not, if you want to be a non-academic. Um, anonymous attendee asks, uh, does the availability of funding in someone's discipline also affect the attrition of postdocs from what you and your team have studied? Um, or does funding, play, does funding play more into some of this family conflict? We don't know that, we haven't seen that it plays into the family conflict dynamic, uh, but the fear that people, uh, A, won't get paid enough won't be able to support their family, 
Um, those kinds of dynamics around uh, people's thinking about fields, particularly in the academy, is a problem, right? So the I'll show you. Um, boo, 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 boo. So what we ask is the pros and cons of academic careers, right? If you we ask these questions, will you be better? Is this thing better in the academy or better outside of the academy? And you see that postdocs say things like, yeah, I'll be more respected as an expert in the academy. I'll have a more rewarding career in the academy. I'll have better professional networks. My research will be more impactful in the academy. But then when we ask them, well, do you believe you'll have more job security in the academy? They say, no, no, and hell no. When we say, well, you have more work-life balance, they say, no, no, and hell no. And certainly if we say, do you think that you make more money, not, um, enough money, but more money, you know, 3% of our postdocs say that jobs uh, in the academy pay better. So I think one of the dynamics is, and faculty have got to think, faculty at the graduate level and the postdoc level, have got to think about how is it that people have experienced us, many of us who are associate professors and full professors, uh, assistant professors routinely, as much as we think nobody gets tenure, most people who get past their fourth year review get tenure across the disciplines. And so there is a lot more job security. The problem is in, we, are, we are like the only job that tells people who wanna be in the job, you're gonna get fired from this job. Like we're the only discipline that does that, right? And so some of it is we are counteracting our own desire to have our students follow us by not showing them the level of job security we have, or at least having them think about it, right? Think about their tolerance for ambiguity, right? I, don't, I can't promise you tenure, but the likelihood that you'll get tenure is pretty high if you do these three things. And if you find you can't do these three things now, you probably don't wanna get a postdoc because you're not gonna get better at it by magic, right? Same thing with the work-life balance. How do they look at us and think we don't have lives I had a life as an assistant professor. I had a life as a graduate student, as a graduate student. Um, but what faculty do is we 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 have what we call the faculty mystique of, you know, our postdoc and our graduate students say, Richard, what did you do this weekend, uh, Memorial Day weekend? And I always feel this obligation to say, I worked. I was sitting <laughs> in my computer, slaving away. When I know I had a life, I sat on the couch with my cats and watched some TV and went to a parade and put some Legos together and made some really good meals and all these, went on a date or two, but we're just not allowed to say that because we really, one of the problems with being faculty is we don't have constant ways of showing productivity. And so we have to show our productivity in rhetoric, which when we're telling trainees who we want to be like us when they grow up and they hear that my whole life, including my weekends, vacation weekends, are all sitting in front of the computer instead of here I am in San Diego. No, I went to the beach like everybody else. And so some of it is like, how do they come away from years of experience with us, more experience with faculty and teachers than any other profession in the world, right? They've experienced this at every single level of their life, right? That they come away saying, we don't have a life and we can't pay our bills. How is that possible? And some of it is because we are modeling and partly in our mentoring that, you know, our life mostly sucks and there are no benefits to following us into the academy other than the ones I showed you. Oh, well, you know, I get to control my life and I have impact, but oh, my actual life sucks. That's us. That's us. That is not, there's not enough money. That's because we say, oh, I ain't no money. NIH is shutting us down. NSF is shutting us down then why don't you drop out? Oh, because you know there's gonna be resources. Right. That's, uh, yeah, yeah, uh, what you just said is gonna change the way I talk to my students. So thank you, that's actually like, <laughs> that's, that's a revelation. Cause yeah, that is the way we tend to talk to our students. Um, uh, another question, I, I think you already answered this. Do kids handicap women more than men? Uh, they do, they do. They, we don't see it. This is the thing though, we don't see it in, and I, I always am like, I want to see a gender effect here. And what we don't necessarily see is the gender effect in that uh, 50 something percent. So men 
say that their kids get in the way of their productivity at the same rates as women say their kids get in the way of their productivity. What I think would be useful, and we didn't tap into this with the qualitative research, is how does that work? Does age of the child shape that differently, et cetera? So we didn't find, just in the quantitative, we didn't find a difference between men and women in terms of that, um, that answer, but we think there's some qualitative differences that would have to be unpacked by age of child and uh, some other things. Good question, though. Yeah, we didn't find a gender difference. Another anonymous attendee asks a, a, a gender-related question. The statistic about women tending towards government jobs is very interesting. What could be some reasons that happens? Um, so it's actually not all women. It's Black women. And some of that is a function of Black people's trust in government over these other two institutions. So in spite of the fact, you know, that in certain, um, what do you call them, in certain political landscapes, you're not sure you want to trust the government. Uh, the Black community overwhelmingly trusts the government, overwhelmingly thinks that a government job is a secure job relative to an industry job, where if, if the industry people don't want to continue to making dinosaurs, right? Or the dinosaurs start eating people, well then they will shut down, but government doesn't shut down, right? And so it's that because again, you can imagine this, that black people historically have been able to get a government job, whether that's as a teacher or a nurse or somewhere in government way before they could get an industry job and certainly before they can get an academic job. So it's not um, all women, it is really specific to white women, I mean, to black women. Was there something you wanted to show us on this slide? Uh, just that it was black women. Okay. Got White it. women go to industry at this, like everybody else. Uh, Jane Rector asks, have you done any research on how disability influences these statistics and problems or creates new problems for academics? No, we didn't even think to ask the disability question until the second wave of the survey. So we're chugging through that. Um, and certainly, I suppose there, it's, it's also because it's um, the first survey is just a one year survey. We also can't tell the relationship between mental health dynamics. So the depression, the anxiety, et cetera, like is that affecting things? Like what's the direction um, of that to productivity and to health? Like what we can see is that it's related. Like I said, work family conflict uh, is negatively correlated to positive health. Um, but what we can't do is say the health affects this or the health affects the conflict or the conflict affects the health. We can't really know that. Okay. Uh, Addison Sherman asks, could subsidized childcare reduce some of the problems postdocs face with work-life balance and having children? Good. I, yes. That would be a structural difference, a structural change. Um, was there any data on couples that held off on having kids in order to more comfortably pursue degrees at the same time? Ah, no, we didn't do that at all. No, no, no. And, and, I, and I'm like dying to do, you know, this is my next NSF grant, is trying to get money to not only study graduate students in the same way we study postdocs, because um, again, there were lots of revelations in this work that are just absent from the graduate student uh, research, but also we need to understand these trailing spouses at the graduate level. We need to understand who these men are, for me, uh, who can pause their life for six years while their girlfriends and wives and fiancés pursue uh, six years of training. Like, how do you freeze your life? And why is it that this is not quite the same thing for my little sister who went to medical school, right? Uh, her partners and her friends' partners all understood what they were getting into. People do not understand what they're getting into with the PhD. And some of that is because nobody understands what our job is. Like the idea that I'm talking to you today um, for however long it takes for us to talk, like my family cannot understand how I've been getting paid um, at UCSD since June and I'm having a conversation with you. They don't, like, why aren't you at work, right? 
And so families just do not understand what this is. And some of it is helping uh, postdocs and graduate students alike help their kids and helping their families of origin and helping their partners understand what this is and what this isn't. Uh, just a couple more questions, if 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 you're okay with it. Um, yeah. So, so somebody asks, um, uh, you know, basically, is the, is there a difference in how men and women view disruption by children? Perhaps in the gender effect lies more in the tolerance towards children's antics. Is there a? I I'd love the follow up. That person wants to go on voice. Whoever what, asked what that question, an, anonymous attendee. Ah, uh, anonymous attendee. Yeah, um, but if they, but if, you, if they want to raise their hand, they're welcome to. But uh, of course, then they won't be anonymous. So ask it again, so I can get clarity. So 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 the full question is: Would a future question be about how men versus women view disruption by children? Perhaps the gender effect lies more in the tolerance towards children's antics. Towards children's antics. Well, well, in terms of gender, one of the things that is just real. Period. And again, I wish it wasn't, but it is. Is how two parents, even if they are both in their mind egalitarian, right? You know, I'm, I'm a sociologist and I get really frustrated in a discipline that talks about feminism all the time, um, that in real practice, our women still act like we're in the 1950s. And it's like, but you're a gender scholar. I don't understand why, why you're acting like a girl here. I don't understand. Um, and some of it is because before any of us became scientists, we were boys and girls and we were raised to be boys and girls and we were socialized to be boys and girls. And just because we get married and, and you know, know better, we don't flip a gear and suddenly know better and do better. And so what is true is that when a, a heterosexual couple has a child, what winds up happening is he is incompetent in doing the childcare she feels more responsibility in doing the child care, literally. If that child bumped its head, somebody's mother-in-law will be calling and it'll be his, her mother-in-law complaining about how this child got dropped, not the other way around. He will not get the blame for while the child hit their head on the side of the table, right? And so, and so in terms of like, the woman in these relationships having to do gender, having to do parenting, mothering, different than the men, like that is stable, period, hard stop, even when people want to think differently and do differently. And so this idea of the kids and their antics, what husbands do is say, oh, I'll hang out with the kids and play with the kids. I will, I will babysit, like literally, people who have degrees, often even in the social sciences, men say they will babysit their own kids, which means they are not fathering at the same level that their wives and girlfriends are mothering. And that's just real, which will probably affect her having to do extra work that he's not doing. We can have whole conversations about our changes to parental leave that allow a man who had a child without asking, are you gonna be the primary caregiver and your wife is gonna to continue to go, go to work? Or is she gonna stay at home and we're gonna give you 15 weeks of leave because you're parenting and totally ignore how that uh, imbalances gender in our departments, right? Because we wanna pretend like, oh, all are equal and all genders are the same and everybody's educated and is gonna do the right thing. And that's not how it works, it's not as easy uh, to do uh, again, as even those of us who want to do it right uh, believe. So oh, yeah, just gonna ask, men aren't gonna cool one with their child's antics; they walk out of the room. <laughs> um, last question, uh, which takes us in a slightly different direction: um, Did you look into how being a postdoc affects having time to spend with parents and other family members, like siblings, and whether or not that has an effect on whether the postdoc decides to stay in academia? We didn't. So that seems like a great project for somebody else. Uh, we sort of limited to uh, family of destination, if you will. So, um, you know, your partners and your kids as opposed to family of origin and extended family, which you can imagine again, with an aging population, like who is the family that I have to make decisions for? Uh, so one of the things we ask people is, do you have to live near your family, you and your spouse? 
Um, and that gets at some of this, but doesn't get at it in the direct way. I think you're asking. Right. So um, that's all I have time for. I actually have to get somewhere else. So I think I need to shut down the, <laughs> the webinar. So so thank you. There's still other questions, not not that many, but some um, I may send them to you. And if you have time to scribble answers, that would be appreciated. But uh, it's only a handful. Um, so thank you very, very much. I uh, really appreciated it. Very eye opening and and thought provoking. And uh, still got 40 people here, uh, you know, almost half an hour after uh, our normal session. So and far more questions than we normally have. So that just tells you that there's there's intense demand and need for what you're what you're talking about. So thanks. Thanks for taking well, the time. Always, Ariel. I'm, I love hanging out with you. We've now hung out together four different times. <laughs> who would have thought? Um, and so thanks for inviting me. And again, for those of you who have been here, thanks for coming and thanks for staying. I appreciate it. Thank you. Let me turn off the recording.